which is the inspired word of God, is the final and the only authority when addressing the subject of Jesus' second coming. And when we say coming again, we're talking about his second coming. And so we need to look nowhere else but in the word of God. The Bible is arranged as we look at it from this uh, subject matter into three uh, great divisions. And we're not talking about the Old Testament, New Testament, and some third. Uh, we're talking about in reference to Jesus' is coming. First, he is coming from Genesis to Malachi. That is, the Old Testament announces his first coming. Second, it says he is here, and that is from Matthew uh, to John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, that teaches us that he is here, and we're going to look at each of these. And then finally, or third, uh, he is coming again, and that is the message from Acts to Revelation. So we'll be looking at it from these uh, three standpoints. Our scripture will be from Acts chapter 1 and 9 through 11. This is as Jesus leaves the earth, uh, the announcement of his coming again is set forth by the, I believe, the angel who appeared on this scene. And when he has spoken these things, that is, when Jesus has spoken these things, while they, in this case, the 11 apostles, uh, beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel, which also said, Ye men of Galilee, which identifies the people that are in the pronouns here. Ye men of Galilee, the eleven uh, men who would be apostles of Christ. Why stand ye gazing up into heaven? Now their eyes were looking upward in the direction of, of the upper part of our atmosphere. This same Jesus, they were watching Jesus as he ascended, and the messengers here says, this same Jesus that your eyes are focusing upon as he is taken up, uh, this same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. And so these two uh, men, uh, I think best, uh, angels, messengers from heaven, uh, they have announced in this, as Jesus left the earth, that he is coming again. So they have announced his second coming. Uh, several things that we need to recognize. First of all, as our lectureship has proven, uh, that a number of subjects, and we have looked at uh, nine, this is the tenth lesson uh, out of twelve, that the subjects thrill the heart, they challenge the spirit, and they bring peace to uh, the soul of man. This is what the Bible does, and when we teach the Bible, uh, this is the result if we have a, a love of truth in our heart. Here, the promise of the New Testament is that Jesus is coming again, as that is our subject, but that is the promise uh, of the New Testament. Uh, that is what it is looking for. It is pointing in that direction. Jesus, that same one who went up, uh, is coming again. There were naysayers. Those who denied it in the first century, uh, the Bible addresses it, uh, even as it was being written. They were people who denied that Jesus would come again. They questioned it. In 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1 and 2, the apostle said, Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him. There is the announcement and there is the promise of the New Testament. He is coming again. But then he went on to say, that ye be not soon shaken in mind. In regard to the coming of Christ again, that he says you should not be soon shaken in mind or be troubled. Now they were shaken and they were troubled by the false teachers of the first century. He says, uh, neither by spirit nor by word nor by letter from us. Even if someone comes claiming to be an apostle or he has a letter written claiming to be written by an apostle, if he does not address the subject correctly in truth, don't be shaken, don't be troubled in regard to the day of Christ is at hand. It was not at hand. The apostles did not teach the second coming of Christ at hand. Now we do find the phrase uh, at hand in reference to the Lord, but it has to do with the destruction of Jerusalem, and he would be coming in judgment on Jerusalem, and that would be referred to as a coming of the Lord but it's not the second coming of the Lord. And so Paul clarifies it. Don't be shaken. In 
2 Peter 3, verse 2 and 4. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days, and that would be the last days of the Jewish age, I believe, that he's referring to, the time in which they were living in. Scoffers. Yes, in the days in which the apostles were there, present, in which they were writing, that which would be the New Testament, now they were scoffers. Walking after their own lust. That's one of the things scoffers do. And saying, where is the promise of his coming? Now, if you can imagine, we are less than 40 years away uh, from the ascension and the announcement he's coming again, and we have people walking around, troubling the church, and questioning, where is his coming? Well, he didn't say that he was going to come within 40 years. It's now been more than 2,000 years that he hasn't come yet. I'm not shaking in mind, nor am I troubled about his coming, and here we are in less than 40 years, and some were. But then the, the apostle goes on. Here's what the, they say. For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Well, they were wrong about that, and they were wrong about the second coming of Christ. The Lord did not promise that he was going to come in the days of the apostles. Paul made it clear that's not the case. But the scoffers were, were questioning it. All things continue, and they go all the way back to creation. And of course, they were willing to ignore some of the facts. Well, the scoffers were wrong then, and their comrades of today are just as wrong. When we talk about the Lord's coming, yes, he is coming again, but not in the way in which we humans might think so or another time. And so he is coming. In the Old Testament, it announced that he is coming. The prophets pointed that to the first coming, however, that they were looking for. And I'm going to introduce now uh, my only $100 word that I know. And I learned while I was in school, and I give you the story before, uh, I thought when the teacher said this word, what do I need, uh, why do I need this word? Well, I just kept it in my vocabulary, so I only used it about every two or three years in talking about this subject, but it is a Latin word Protevangelium, uh, and I don't know how I learned how to say that. I have trouble with the English uh, word, but uh, we'll go on. Uh, which means the first pronouncement of Christ. Uh, that's all it means. So you break it down to a 10 cent word. Uh, it is recorded. Where is the first pronouncement of Christ recorded? Well, it is in Genesis 3.15. And God is talking to the serpent who had tempted and succeeded in seducing the Eve. And I will put image to be between thee and the woman. God said to the serpent, I will put image between thee, the serpent, or the devil, the dragon, and the woman. And I and between thy seed and her seed. And he shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. In my thinking, he's probably pointing to the crucifixion of Christ. But, you know, I don't know of any writer in the New Testament who quoted this verse. Now, there may be a reference to it. Uh, Mary knows more about those things than I. Uh, but I don't recall this verse being quoted in the New Testament. But I think it still uh, is true that it is pointing to the coming of Christ and the seed of the woman. And that's the key, I believe, because Jesus is the seed of the woman as he had no earthly father. And so there was no begat in front of Joseph in reference to Jesus. More than likely, throughout the New Testament, uh, we have reference to this uh, promise that God made to Abraham in Genesis 12, 3, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. That is like saying, Abraham, in your seed, singular, shall all families of the earth be blessed. Here is a promise of a future blessing, and it would come through the seed of Abraham. The genealogy of Christ runs through Abraham. Isaac, Jacob, and so on, and Judah, and on down through. And he is promising at the end of that, and we might say when man, or when the Jews would no longer be able to identify uh, their genealogy, and so in essence their genealogy ends with Christ uh, in Abraham's seed. A New Testament writer did refer to this. Uh, the promise made to Abraham in Galatians 3.16, and there's no doubt about who he's talking about. Now to Abraham, and we go right back to the verse above. And his seed, where, where the promise is made, he saith not, and the seeds, as 
of many, but as of one, and to thy seed, which is Christ. And so we have the identity, unmistakable identity, of the seed of Abraham, in whom the promise was made that all families or all nations of the earth would be blessed. And that would be blessed as by obeying the gospel of Christ. And so there is the promise. He is coming. In fact, uh, the, this becomes the promise of the Old Testament. This is what they were looking for. The Messiah, as he is termed. And it is so used in the New Testament to refer to the promise. And notice in Galatians 3, 13 and 14. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law. And then we left out some words because it took too long to put them in. That the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ. So in the promise in which God made to Abraham, it included not only the Hebrews, but it also included the Gentiles. And so Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, that the blessing of Abraham might come uh, on the Gentiles through Jesus Christ, that we might be received the promise of the Spirit through the faith. And I have capitalized the faith. It's not in your Bible, but it's in the Greek text. And so well, that's important, that we're not talking about what I believe is my personal faith, but the faith. And that faith is, of course, the one revealed. The death of Jesus was necessary. We could not receive the promise uh, that God made to Abraham, the blessing that came through that, without the death of Christ. They are dependent upon the death. And so that the blessing of Abraham might come on the Gentiles. The death was necessary. That's what he's talking about. That we, and more than likely we here would be the Hebrews, uh, Paul being a Hebrew, I might receive the promise of the Spirit through the faith. And again, that's important. The promise of the Spirit is not the Spirit himself. It is the promise which the Spirit made to Abraham when he gave the promise. That's what he's referring to. And that's the way it needs to be understood. It is necessary that we notice now the reading of the Greek text, uh, which has a definite article, the, before the word faith. Pointed it out, and now we want to follow that through for a moment. Therefore, making the, it read correctly, through the faith, the gospel of Christ, the New Testament. That's how the blessing of Abraham is received. Now, made to Abraham way back, but it is received through the gospel of Christ, through our obeying the gospel of Christ. The faith was once for all time delivered. This is what Jude says in chapter or verse 3. Jude says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me. In essence, he's saying it was more needful at this time for me to write and to exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So he's talking about the revelation. It was delivered and it was written and preached orally. But it was the faith, the revelation. And it is used this way throughout the third chapter of Galatians, and we'll notice uh, the following, Galatians 3.23. The Greek text has that definite article, the, before the word faith. Therefore, the text should read, before the faith came. But what was before the faith? Before the revelation of the New Testament? Well, we had the old law. So it is a comparison. While the old law was there, and before the new the, the faith was come, we were kept under the law. He identifies it exactly. Shut up. Under the law, the Jews were. Until the faith, which should afterwards be revealed. And so when it was time for the Old Testament to be closed up and sealed, the new faith would be revealed. And that is the way it reads in Galatians 3, 20, uh, 4, 25. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster. Now he's talking to Jews. The old law is not my schoolmaster. I never was under it. It never took me by the hand and led me as it did the Jew. But uh, that's important when we're studying. To bring us unto Christ. What was the purpose? It was to take the Jew, to take him by the hand, and to lead him unto Christ and put his hand in Christ. That we might be justified by faith. But after that, the faith is come. We are no longer under the schoolmaster. The Hebrew, for 1,500 years, 
had been living by and was subject to the law. The schoolmaster. <coughs> and when the faith has been delivered, you're no longer under the schoolmaster. And we Gentiles never were under the schoolmaster. Galatians 3.27 For you are all the children of God by the faith in Christ Jesus. And he goes on. Now notice the apostle's conclusion of what the faith will do in our obedience to it. Galatians 3, 27 through 29. For as many of you have been baptized into Christ, and that's associated with our obedience through the gospel, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor bond, there is neither uh, bond or free, there is neither male or female, for we are all one in Christ. As I made a point a while back, God is looking at us not physically, not as who we are, but he's looking at, at us spiritually. And we are one, the seed of Abraham. And if you be Christ, that is, if you belong to him by your obeying the gospel, then are you Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. And there it is. That promise made throughout the Old Testament. He is coming. And how do you get into the blessings of that promise? Well, you have to be baptized into Christ. Then you are a child of God. And then... You can be an heir to the promise. You can receive the promises that were made. So when a person puts on Christ, as when he is baptized into Christ, he becomes Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Made in the Old Testament. Realized in the New Testament. He is coming, is what the Old Testament kept saying. But when we get into the New Testament, it doesn't say he's coming. It says, no, he is here. And notice one other passage in the Old Testament. Near the end of the Old Testament, uh, there is, it is continued to be proclaimed, He is coming, in Micah 5, verse 2. But thou, Bethlehem, Ethereth, thou, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me, that is, to be the ruler of Israel. Where is the one to come forth who will be the ruler of Israel? He'll come forth to Bethlehem, whose going is forth have been from old and from everlasting. We're not talking about humanity. No, it's more than uh, humanity. In fact, it's going to be deity and humanity combined together in one person. But he's pointing, he's coming. And he's going to come, he's going to be in Bethlehem. That's going to be the beginning of it. In Luke chapter 2, verse 4 and 5. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, as that's where he lived, made his living, out of the city of uh, Nazareth, uh, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem. And there is Micah's Bethlehem. And where was Jesus born? In Bethlehem. Because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his spouse, wife, being great with child. I want you to notice that. I underline that for a reason. Child has not been delivered, but she is with child. And I want to make that point. She is with child. We'll get into that here in a moment. In Luke 2, verse 8 through 11, the shepherds were abiding in the field, watching their flock, a flock by night. Verse 9, and lo, the angel of the Lord, or the messenger from heaven of the Lord, came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone around about them, and they were sore afraid. And I would be too. Angel suddenly appeared. I'd be afraid. They were afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not. For behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy. And what is it? The promise of Abraham. He's down in Bethlehem. The one who was coming, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David the Savior. The city of David is Bethlehem. We learned that, which is Christ the Lord. Who is he? He's Christ the Lord. The Old Testament said he is coming. Now the announcement is made. He is here. The angel said it to the shepherds. He is here. Here is the seed of Abraham, as Paul wrote in Galatians 3.16. And now to Abraham and his seed with the promises made. And he says, not as of the seed, but of many, but as of one and of thy seed, which is Christ. That's what the angels were announcing. 
He that is the Christ, he is here, unborn, but he is here in the womb of Mary. So the angel of the Lord to the shepherds announced, he is here. And then there is the old man. I kind of sympathize with him. I send him. In Jerusalem, at this time, it was a bit later, but not much later. At this time, there was a man named Simeon. It appears that he was a prophet who had uh, been promised by the Holy Spirit. Now think about that for a moment. Here is a man in Jerusalem, one man in Jerusalem, one among Judea, one among Israel, but the Spirit went to this man and he promised to him that he should not taste death till he see, or till he had seen, the Lord's Christ. Jehovah's anointed. In verses 27 through 30, and he came by the Spirit, being directed by the Holy Spirit uh, into the temple on this day. And when the parents brought the child Jesus, he is born now, isn't he? They brought him the babe, the child Jesus, to do for him after the custom of the law. That was to have him circumcised on the eighth day, I believe. Then took he, that is Simon, or Simeon, took the, the babe in his arms and uh, blessed him and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to thy word. What's he saying? Let's just read on. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. He that was coming is here, and my eyes have looked upon him, and he was looking upon the babe, and held in his arms. So yes, throughout the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it is announced in a number of different ways. He is here. Not that he's coming, no, that's ended. But he's here. In John 1, 14, which we've covered earlier, uh, Benjamin did that uh, Thursday night. And the word of John 1, verse 1, that was in the beginning with God and was God, was made. And I want you to notice the word made, it's underlined. Was made flesh. The word, that is God, was made flesh and dwelt among us. But dwelt among us humans. We beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. That word made is important. The Greek word made is genomia, something like that. Uh, to come into existence, to begin to be. It's the same word as Benjamin pointed out uh, Thursday night. And uh, not anything that was made that was made that was not made by Jesus Christ. That is by the word. Creation came into to existence. It did not exist. And then it came into existence. And so the Word was made flesh. There is a very specific point in time in which He began to exist in flesh. Now, deity did not start existing. Deity exists. He, he is. But in flesh, He started existing. So God existed. That began to exist, started to dwell in flesh and in a flesh and blood body. He came into existence. Now when? Well, let's go a little further. Galatians 4, verse 4. Paul wrote, But when the fullness of the time has come, God sent forth his son. Made. Same word. Made of a woman, made under the law. Same word. Same Greek word, same English word. And so the word made, as made in a woman and made it under the law, is the same Greek word. And what does it mean? And therefore the apostle is saying, God sent forth his son who came into existence of a woman. And under the law, he began to exist. God was never subject to the law of Moses. He's the lawgiver. But this new being in flesh and blood where God dwelt, he was subject to the law. And Jesus was very definitely and made himself subject to the law. And he made it known that he obeyed it. And so the same point is made in Philippians 2, verse uh, 5 through 8. 
into existence in the likeness of men at a certain time. Remember, our subject here is, he is here. The one they were looking for is now here. But how is he here? Who is he? At a certain point in time, before that point in time, he did not exist. God existed, but God in the flesh did not exist, and that's what we're talking about. Therefore, there is a point in time when deity started dwelling in a flesh and blood body. But when was it? Friends, I outline this because it's important to us today. The Bible is just as relevant today as it was when it was written. Jesus, in the God in the flesh, came into existence at the conception. Now, I'll prove that to you. In case you're reluctant. In Matthew chapter 1, verse 18, a virgin was found with child. A virgin was found with child. Before the delivery now, was found with child. But the Greek word expresses the thought of a child in the womb. That's where the child was when she was found with child. The child was in the womb. You don't become a being, a human being, when at birth. You become a human being at conception. Virgin shall be with child. Matthew 1, 23. While Isaiah said, chapter 7, verse 14, a virgin shall conceive. The Holy Spirit knew exactly what he was talking about. Conception and being with child is one and the same thing. To conceive is to be with child. When Mary was traveling to Bethlehem, she was with child. We still use the same terms today. It's only our highly educated, God denying, who make a difference. We common people know the difference. Isaiah said he is coming. Matthew says he is here. But who is he? Hebrews 1, verse 3 tells us who he was in a splendid terminology. Who, that is, the Son of God, being the brightness of God's glory, and the expressed image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins. Any doubt who we're talking about? We're talking about the one who died on the cross. Purged our sins. And then he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. His ascension. As the apostle watched him go, he ultimately arrived at the right hand of God and took his seat. And there he says today, who is he? He is the express image of God's person, God's being. Image means a precise reproduction in every respect. We might say in every iota, smallest particle, if you can get there. Jesus is a perfect reproduction, if you will. In the person of Jesus, humanity had God dwelling among them in the precise reproduction in every respect, and that is God was clothed in flesh and blood. Now you can't see God, he's invisibly in spirit. But we can see the flesh and blood body, they could. And in that flesh and blood body dwelt deity. And I want to point out in a whole other discussion, that's the only time that deity ever actually bodily, physically, personally, if we can say physically, he's not spirit, dwelt in human flesh. Never before and never since. We can end a lot of debates. We understood that. So yes, through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, God made the announcement. He is here. First in the womb of Mary. But he is here. What about it? John 20, verse 30 and 31, John the Apostle wrote, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. We just have a few. John said, I wrote these. No, they be few, but I wrote them, and they are totally sufficient that you might believe that he, uh, Jesus is the Christ, the anointed of God, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And so what's the purpose? That you might believe that you might have life through his name. And John said, I've written a sufficient amount to bring that about. God kept his promise. He had made in the Old Testament, and he will keep the promise of his heavenly messenger in the New Testament, Acts 1, verse 11.
it's also said, that is the two men. Ye men of Galilee, why stand ye gazing into heaven? As if you'll never see that Jesus who is taken up from you again. Don't look like that. It's not the end. In essence, we're just changing uh, focus. That same Jesus which is taken up from you into heaven shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He went up into heaven and he's going to come down through the heavens. And that's what he is saying. He is here. But he's also said he's coming again. That's what he says here. He's here, but he's coming again. And that's our third point. Upon the words, upon these words, spoken by the two men, I think angels, hangs the entirety of the New Testament and hangs our hope. Take away that promise. I have no reason to live the way I do, except it is a better life after all. Even now, here, if that was all over to it, it would still be better. But I have something beyond this. If he is not coming again, what else matters? Think about it. The grave holds the end of all things. But we have a promise. Titus 1, verse 2, Paul said of God, in hope of eternal life, which God cannot lie, promised before the world began. I think he's talking about the Jewish world, but be that as it may, God cannot lie, and he promised. And we've already seen he fulfilled his first promise. He is coming, he is here, and now he's coming again. Same God. Made all three promises. So he promised in Genesis 3, he promised in Genesis 12, 3. All about eternal life through the seed. We must be able to look the scholars. To question the second coming of Christ, look them right in the eye and repeat the words of Jesus to his troubled disciples. That's the kind of faith we need to have. And what do I mean by that? Listen. Before Jesus left this earth, oh, they had a confused idea about the kingdom. Jesus had just told them in chapter 13 he's going to be put to death. Judas is going to betray and he's going to be put to death. All their hope just sank. And so what did Jesus say? Let not your heart be troubled. In the midst of that confusion and depression, if we might say, Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. It's just this simple. You believe in God, believe in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. Have I not been truthful with you every step of the way? Every step of the word, every word I've spoken is true. And if it wasn't true, I would have told you it's not true. Don't put your hopes in it. It's not true. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you where I am, I will come again. Jesus said before he ever leaves. I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself that where I am, there you may be also. And so you look the scoffer in the eye and he says, oh, where's his coming? It's been 2,000 years. Where's he coming? And he kind of laughs at you and you said, Jesus said he's coming again and I believe him. And I'll put my eternity in that belief. At the same time, we must understand a few facts. And this is why we get confused because we don't know the facts. We have a lot of teachings going on that teaches us the wrong things, and we need to be able to separate them. So if we heard, they move along. Uh, first, 2 Peter 3, verse 8, But beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing. And a lot of people are ignorant of this one thing. That one day he is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. It looks like a long time, 2,000 years. Two days. That's the way God looks at it. Don't be shaken. Don't be troubled. God doesn't look at time the way we do. In fact, it's not even for God, it's for us. The Greek word translated shaken in the passage of 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 and 2 expresses the idea, be not, we must not be moved in mind, we must not be agitated in mind, and we must not be disturbed in mind. says, but of that day, talking about the second coming of Christ, and hour knoweth no man, and yet men have for many years, hundreds of years, 
have tried to identify the second coming of Christ. Jesus said before he left, that foolish man is going to come in 1914 and he's going to announce the coming of the Lord. They don't believe him. And the one that said he was going to come last year and the year before, don't believe him. He doesn't know. He says at that day and hour, no, no man, not then, not now, not ever. 24, 37 through 39. But as in the days of Noah were, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. Jesus said, I'll give you a sign. You want a sign? Here it is. If you think you can identify a day, a time out of this, uh, go ahead if you can. For as in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark. What's it going to be like? Just like that. People are going to be doing day by day just what they've always done. And so Jesus is saying in essence, there are no signs. There is no sign, period. They knew not until the flood came. Now Noah kept coming. There's a flood coming. And he built a mark based on the faith that God's word, it's going to come. He'd never seen the flood. Never even seen the mark. No doubt in my mind, he'd seen boats. <coughs> he'd never seen a mark like this one. But he believed God and he kept telling the people, it's coming. It's like he's coming, but it's coming in their case. And take them away, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. There'll be no signs. We just preach it. He's coming. And man will believe it or not believe it, but he won't change the fact he is coming. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things so far and the evidence of things not seen. Our faith stands on the Word of God. And God said, He's coming back again. slack concerning his promise that some mean come slackness, you see. Some are saying in 2,000 years he's not coming at all. It was a false promise. Don't believe it. No, God doesn't count things the way we do. He doesn't look at things the way we do. As some mean count slackness, but his long suffering to usward. Usward is that we humans. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Every day that God waits gives one more soul the opportunity to obey the gospel. That's what God is looking at. Salvation for man. He's always looked that way. God promised in our text. And when Jesus had spoken these things, while they beheld us, he was taken up, and the cloud received him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly into the toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel. Which said, Ye men of God, stop gazing into heaven. Why stand you here gazing into heaven? This same Jesus, which is taken up from you into heaven, shall so come in like manner as you have seen him go into heaven. He went up, he'll come down. That's the idea of it. So what will take place at the coming? 1 Thessalonians 4, 16. The dead shall be raised first. For the Lord himself shall descend. Second coming from heaven with a shout. Where did the angel say to the apostles? He will come. As he went into heaven, he'll come out of heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Now, I don't know about those who are not in Christ, but I know about those who are in Christ. They will rise first. Verse 17. Then the living shall be caught up. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them, the dead in Christ, in the clouds, to be, meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. You know, he doesn't say the Lord will ever put one foot on the earth. No. He's coming, and we're going to meet him. What a reunion that is. <laughs> there will be also a final judgment. And we'll get that a little later today. But I want to touch on it as what it does mean to us. In uh, Acts 17, 30, 31, and in the time of this ignorance, speaking back in the old time, God made that but now. Commanded all men everywhere to repent. So it is the obligation of every soul to obey the gospel. There's no other way to be saved. And verse 31 says, because he has appointed a day. Why do you need to repent? Why do you need to obey the gospel? Because God has appointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained whom he hath appointed, 
you also ready. For in such an hour as you think not the Son of Man coming. You don't know when he's coming. Who then is a faithful and a wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his own household to give them meat in due time season? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find so doing. That's what it means to us. We have a job to do, and we ought to do it with passion. 